Good afternoon or good morning to all of you participants worldwide and welcome to this webinar on hypophosphatasia, pathogenesis, diagnosis and management. My name is Dominique Pierrot and I'm the science manager at IOF and I'm glad to be the moderator of this webinar. Uh, before introducing the speaker of the day, I just would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. Um, can you see my slides well? I'm not sure. If you can put Dominique in presentation because it's still not in presentation. Yes, that's what I'm because it moved to sorry, it moved to my to my to another to my second screen. Uh, sorry for this uh, technical uh, problem. Uh, let me move it. Ah. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, we are having, ah, uh, it's supposed to be, uh, well, I like, I want to move, I cannot move it, sorry, uh, why can, can't I move it to the other screen? I'm just going to shut this one down. Okay, is it is it better like that? Yes. Uh, so before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing them in the question box of the control panel. And I will voice uh, them to the speaker towards the end of this webinar. I also would like to thank Alexion for the support to this webinar. This being said, uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, to welcome today Professor Maria Luisa Brandi, uh, who is Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolic Diseases at the University of Florence in Italy, uh, where she's directing the regional program on hereditary endocrine tumors and the bone and metabolic unit. Professor Brandi is also the president of FIRMO, an Italian society dedicated to osteoporosis, and is part, who is, which is part of the IOF Committee of National Societies. Professor Brandi is a member of the steering committee of the European Reference Center's network on rare bone diseases, and she is a member of the IOF, and she is a board member of the IOF and the co-chair of the IOF Skeletal Rare Disorders Academy. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Brandy for her talk about hypophosphatasia. Professor Brandy, we are listening to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pierron. And I am going to tell you today about uh, hypophosphatasia, pathogenesis, diagnosis and management, an area that we have been very much involved in too in the past uh, decade, and most of all, an area that is uh, part of the actions uh, of the IOF Skeletal Rare Disease Academy. Next slide, please. These are my conflicts of interest. Next slide. And when we talk about hypophosphatasia, we have to talk about uh, skeletal mineralization. We will know this very soon why. And the skeletal mineralization goes back uh, into the biomineralization that happens to be after the Cambrian explosion in our, um, in our world, in uh, the Earth. In fact, after that, moment, uh, uh, biomineralization started to happen in uh, uh, living beings, uh, in animals, very small size animals at those times, until we get to the biomineralization in uh, bigger animals and we get to the hydroxyapatite, what we call the perfect crystal light, because it's small, it's very stable, it's elastic uh, and shows a mechanic anisotropy. So bone mineralization is in fact triggered by the combination of calcium and phosphate that are the components of hydroxyapatite. And I would say that in the bone milieu is in fact 
phosphate, the great master of biomineralization, because it's the uh, iron that is uh, um, um, concentrated in the cell in millimolar concentrations versus uh, uh, calcium that is in macromolar concentration. And just moving phosphate, uh, we can reach in the uh, extracellular environment uh, that uh, product of calcium phosphate that gets to the um, precipitation and then to the, co the, the formation of hydroxyapatite. And the big regulators of this process are, in fact, uh, the osteoblastic cells and the osteocytes that are really the controller of this process uh, through many types of uh, enzymes and proteins. Uh, and remember also uh, the collagen molecule that is so important for the precipitation of uh, uh, the hydroxyapatite in the collagen cores, where, in fact, there are specific areas where the mineral I can deposit. And the number of proteins are involved and certainly alkaline phosphatase. And that's the reason for which we want to introduce biomineralization, just focusing on this very important protein that in fact is the cause when it does in function of hypophosphatasia. Next slide, please. Next slide. And when we talk about uh, alkaline phosphatase, we have to understand that that is a, a very promiscuous type of enzyme. Uh, because, in fact, uh, uh, the enzyme that is catalyzing uh, phosphoryl transfer is uh, a nectonucleotide. Bases. And that these enzymes are very well expressed even in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So they are very well conserved in the evolution. And they are found obviously also in any mammalian tissue. And their number of specificity can vary among the different animal species. Uh, the human genome, for what regards the humans, uh, encodes for alkaline phosphatase genes uh, whose names reflect their predominant but couldn't be exclusive uh, tissue distribution. So we have the placental alkaline phosphatase, the germ cell alkaline phosphatase, the intestinal alkaline phosphatase, and the so-called tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase because it's highly expressed in kidney, liver, and obviously bone. And this our protein, the one that we are very interested on when we talk about hypophosphatasia. This enzyme is an ectophosphatase, and it acts, in fact, in, in, the, in uh, making available in the extracellular milieu the um, a phosphate in order to increase the calcium phosphate product. It, it works uh, as uh, a dimer, where we have two parts of the molecules composed by al the alkaline phosphatase gene uh, encoded proteins, uh, and they act as a dimer. And there are many areas that are of great interest in terms of uh, uh, um, activity of these two molecules, of these two, uh, of this dimer, because uh, they are composed of areas that we consider of great importance. And because each one of these areas has a function either in anchoring the protein to the membrane or in uh, interacting with ions. And we are deciphering at this time the function of the protein whose uh, crystal has been, uh, um, in fact, isolated and characterized. So um, I think that from alkaline phosphatase, we are going to learn a lot in the future here because the function of this molecule are just partially known. Next slide, please. And the function of the uh, alkaline, um, the tissue non specific alkaline phosphatase uh, is very critical in metabolizing three substrates. That is the pyridoxal 5 phosphate, the inorganic pyrophosphate, and phosphoethanolamine. Uh, we have to uh, consider this, uh, remember these uh, important molecules because they will become important later on when we get into diagnosis of hypophosphatasia. Next slide. In fact, here is the enzyme in this dimer form 
what it does this enzyme mostly in the uh, extracellular milieu in the uh, bone tissue is to uh, separate pyrophosphate into molecules and now phosphate can link to calcium and then we have the precipitation of the hydroxyapatite. This function is very important because pyrophosphate is very well known uh, to be an inhibitor of the process uh, of hydroxyapatite formation, as we will see later. When the protein doesn't function for any reason, then we will have an accumulation of pyrophosphate, and eventually we can have also precipitation, not of the hydroxyapatite, but the calcium and pyrophosphate uh, precipitate that has other functions as we will see, and in fact, it has also an impact on what is the symptomatology and the consequences of hypophosphatasia. Next slide, please. The compounds that we said being uh, actually the uh, main, uh, um, uh, the main target of this enzyme are also compounds that are part of the so-called vitamin B6 uh, metabolism. In fact, vitamin B6 encompasses a number of compounds with similar biological activity here listed with their names. Uh, and in addition to its role in bone mineralization, then alkaline phosphatase dephosphorylates the vitamin B6, uh, PLP, uh, into pyridoxal, allowing the vitamin B6 to cross the plasma membrane to the central nervous system where the vitamin B6 exerts its function. Uh, within the central nervous system, then, uh, pyridoxal is rephosphorylated into PLP and now it can function. So it's very important then that uh, the, the phosphorylation happens in order to have vitamin B6 functioning at the neurotransmitter uh, level because PLP has function on a number of different neurotransmitters, synthesis like gamma aminobutyric acid, dopamine, serotonin. So consequences of the lack of dephosphorylation means that the protein, the vitamin doesn't cross uh, the uh, barrier, and then we will have consequences that are neurological. In patients that with low alkaline phosphatase, there is a PLP deficiency in the central nervous system, but in fact we have high levels of PLP in the serum because it's not dephosphorylated and it tends to accumulate. Next slide. Alcophosphatasia uh, is actually a very rare disorder that is life threatening, is a progressive and a systemic disorder that is also very heterogeneous with many, as we will see later, endophenotypes. The causal uh, gene is loss of function in the tissue not specific uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, gene. And this mutation result are in decreased activity or null activity, and then in an accumulation of the so-called substrate that are uh, the pyrophosphate, vitamin B6, and phosphatanolamine. Next slide. Uh, many years ago, the group, uh, the French group that I will mention later on in the presentation, headed by uh, Dr. Mornay, characterized uh, a number of genetic mutations because uh, this group actually started to work in this disease uh, several years before that this would become of general interest also in medicine. And they describe uh, a number of mutations with different distribution. Uh, there are mutations that are just more frequent, like the one on exon 9, uh, just because uh, it's a mutation uh, that probably uh, finds uh, a founder effect in Northern Europe and was spread all around Europe, very present in our continent, by the way. Uh, but the mutations are actually spread all around the gene, with some mutations being uh, actually more uh, present. And they can be either missense, small deletions, splicing, nonsense, small insertion, large deletions, insertion deletion, and regulatory uh, delet uh, mutations. So all these mutations can result in lower function or null function of the enzyme. Next slide. 
There are also described a number of variants that we call polymorphisms because they are well represented in the population. So they, we can call these mutation variants, but actually polymorphism. And these are listed in the database. And these polymorphisms are actually used in the, in, in, and detected in diagnostic procedures because they sit in the coding sequence or close to the interaction borders. So we find this well. The, the gene is sequenced and, and characterized for eventual mutations. Next slide. As I said, that is a very heterogeneous uh, disorder that we is systemic, and we can have type, different types. So we have the so the called so called very um, severe form that is manifested at birth, and with a number of uh, features like early loss of teeth, and sometimes we can have also just an odonto form and without bone symptoms. So very different in terms of uh, uh, the phenotype that it manifests with. And despite a continuous of severity, there are six uh, clinical forms that are recognized, the so-called perinatal, prenatal, infantile, childhood, adult, and odonto HPP only, that can manifest either in childhood or adulthood. There is a form that we call autosomal dominant transmission because it acts as a, a, an autosomal dominant inhibition and is uh, uh, transmitted in autosomal dominant fashion. So we need just one allele uh, to uh, be mutated and we will have uh, the hypophosphatasia uh, even in severe uh, type of uh, form. And then there are forms that are the most severe ones that are the so-called autosomal recessive. And this uh, we will visit later on in a slide that is quite explicative, uh, are, uh, need actually uh, the um, uh, manifestation in terms of mutation of two alleles, the one inherited by the mother, the one inherited by the father. Next slide. Here are the six clinical forms that I just uh, um, uh, listed in my uh, previous slide. The perinatal is lethal. Uh, we have uh, um, usually an inheritance that is autosomal recessive. There is hypomineralization, osteochondral spores in these children. Uh, there are um, uh, the, radio, the diagnosis usually made through radiographs and ultrasonography. Then there is the prenatal benign that is autosomal dominant usually. Uh, there is bowing on the long bones uh, and this uh, uh, so-called benign postnatal. The usual uh, clinical diagnosis made to ultrasound and clinical examination. The infantile form that usually is autosomal recessive where we have cranocinosis, hypomineralization, uh, rachidic ribs, hypercalciuria, and uh, hypercalcemia very often with low levels of parathyroid hormone, we can have uh, dental symptoms with pre uh, premature loss uh, of the deciduous teeth. And usually the diagnosis made clinically through examination. Uh, and then the biochemist is serumacaline phosphatase activity and the levels of phosphoethanolamine and vitamin B6 and obviously radiographs. Then we have a childhood form that is usually autosomal recessive, but also more rarely autosomal dominant to a dominant negative effect. The, the patients have are short stature uh, with uh, skeletal deformities, uh, wedding gait bone, pain, fractures. Uh, there is a premature loss of the deciduous teeth also in these children, and the clinical examination by chemist and radiograph make possible the diagnosis. The adult form can be either autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. We have stress fractures, metatarsal tibia, osteoarthritis, and also clinical examination, biochemistry, and radiographs help in the diagnosis. And then there is the odonto uh, hypophosphatasia only that could be either autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant that where we have loss of uh, velar bones, exfoliation, uh, reduced thickness of dentin, enlarged pulp chambers of teeth and dental caries. 
and the clinical examination and biochemistry helped in the diagnosis. Next slide. And this is uh, actually the uh, classification that very recently the group of Monet has been publishing in this very interesting paper where a number of different mutations were evaluated also from different countries in Europe. There is also a history of the mutation of this gene in our continent that is a, is a quite interesting paper for you to read. Um, the analysis that made possible to uh, then classify the hypophosphatasia based on um, either the genetics and the severity. So in three forms, severe, moderate, mild, and this is what happens in the wild type, so no mutated uh, um, subjects. Uh, the inheritance of the severe form was classified as autosomal recessive, very rare disorder, one in 300,000. Uh, the actual classification could be perinatal or infantile, and the genotype could have uh, either the uh, severe uh, genotype or, or severe dominant uh, uh, or severe uh, or and very severe phenotype uh, and also moderate and moderate genotypes. So you see different combinations can actually uh, make possible the expression of every a very severe form. Then we have the so-called moderate form, where we have uh, the combination of, of severe dominant uh, with moderate, uh, uh, severe with moderate, severe dominant, uh, and normal genotype. And this so-called mild form, and this is present in one to 2,400 patients. Uh, so you see, uh, the, for under the population, it starts to be much more frequent than what we were thinking before. And then there is the so-called mild form. With no specific signs, here we have adults that have uh, in, in autosomal dominant, probably haploid insufficiency of the gene. That's the reason for which we don't see specific signs. However, we can have also in this type of mutations, other new mutations. And in the so-called null mutation, we have the so-called upload insufficiency. That means the uh, allele that is normal, as in this case, doesn't seem to function well, because probably there are a number of reasons for which it cannot combine uh, or it combines with uh, the other diseased allele, and then the protein doesn't function appropriately. Or uh, there is the possibility in the so-called uh, hypomorphic alleles, depending on the mutations, that there are other um, actions that don't make this a dominant negative effect, but in fact they are because these alleles could interact with other proteins, like for, for instance the collagen proteins and some of the uh, polymorphism genes that correspond to this protein, in fact, seem to interact with, in, a, in a negative manner uh, with this uh, type of mutations. And then in that case, uh, the hypomorphic allele can uh, actually exert a negative function because of the combination with the collagen protein. So you see, we start to know much better also regarding uh, these uh, uh, mutations uh, from the studies done by this big center that now has information, not only genetic, but, uh, but also clinical, and also from the origin, geographical origin of the different mutations. Next slide. And here we have the uh, hypophosphatasia patient that has uh, problems at the neurological level, where we go from seizures to probably a number of other milder uh, neurological functions that we start now just to understand. So we have probably a number of uh, functions that are uh, not proper in these patients that have not been studied at the largest extent. And the neurological part needs certainly to be better studied in the future. We have a myopathy, chronic muscle pain, and a number of function of the muscle that seems to not proceed in the good way and in, in, the, in the right way. We will visit this later on also in the presentation. We have a number of skeletal phenotypes uh, that are from the severe hypomineralization to cranosynostosis, uh, signs of rickets, osteomalacia, 
fractures uh, that are not actually repairing properly, the so-called non-healing, recurrent fracture, and also fractures that can be um, really a typical fracture of the femur that we can find in these patients. And then there are respiratory failures that happens to be mostly in the uh, very severe form uh, in the neonates uh, with respiratory insufficiency. This is not really very well studied in the adults. And then we can have uh, renal nephrocalcinosis, uh, renal failure, and a lot of rheumatological signs and symptoms uh, uh, because uh, of uh, a number of in, in, in large involvement uh, of the joint, as we will see later in the presentation. Next slide. <coughs> Here, then, we have the uh, low function of the tissue, no specific alkaline phosphatase, an increase of the substrate, and the number of different um, influences uh, in the different system. That's the reason for which we call this a very heterogeneous uh, multi-systemic disorder with many endophenotypes. So it's a disease uh, that doesn't have just a all mark feature, just but a combination that could be also linked to epigenetic uh, uh, function uh, in the single patient, as well as to re regional epigenetic function. Let's think about uh, when we talk about uh, regional or ecological functions, let's think about the use in these patients, for instance, of inhibitors of resorption that changed very much than the evolution of a disease that could have been silent until that moment. Next slide. Uh, uh, why we have extracleidal calcification in a disorder where we have, in fact, a, a reduction in the formation of the mineral in the bone. That's because uh, um, the, in, if, if we want to have a formation of a drug superappetite, we have to have a ratio between phosphate and pyrophosphate uh, higher than 100 to 1. But when we have a ratio that, for instance, between these two ions that is less than three to one, then we can have a precipitation of calcium pyrophosphate. And this can be a very highly inflammatory molecule uh, with a, a number of uh, signaling uh, um, cascades uh, and with very high levels uh, of, uh, of PGE, so the prostaglandin production. Next slide. Which one is the prevalence of this disorder? We just heard before about one, one in 300,000. If we look at what has been published in the bibliography, we have really very different reports. Certainly, if we go in uh, genetic isolate, the, uh, if, uh, the, the numbers are much um, higher in terms of the number of affected patients than what happens uh, in the reports, for instance, in, in uh, 1957 from Toronto. Uh, then there are mutations that are very rare in certain populations, uh, like, for instance, this mutation uh, that, in fact, is uh, uh, estimated in one to 900,000 in the Japan population. We know that Americans with African ancestry have, don't show very frequently hypophosphatasia, and that would be another uh, problem related to founder effects of the mutation. And then in France, uh, in France uh, we will have this initial report of Mornay that was talking on one to 257,000 of the severe form and one in 6,000 of moderate forms. And you have seen at these days that in fact the so-called mild forms are uh, evaluated by uh, the group of Mornay being one in 500 people. So uh, this is an evolution story, but the numbers are much higher than we were thinking once when we were looking only to the very severe forms. Next slide. And adults uh, uh, with the HPP are of great interest uh, to the bone metabolic experts. That's the reason for which IOF wants to put a lot of effort in educating the bone doctors worldwide about this disorder. Because we are going to see the so-called mild phenotypes, uh, and, uh, and in these patients, the clinical expression is even higher 
variable than what we see uh, in uh, uh, the children and in the severe forms. And this is very important to recognize these uh, patients because, for instance, these patients cannot be treated with antiresorptives. Next slide. And how can we make the diagnosis of HPP in an adult patient? Look how many different phenotypic features we have to keep in mind. That's the reason for which in this moment there is a group in the world that is working on defining diagnosis, because that's probably the first very important education matter in defining how to recognize a patient with hypophosphatasia, because we can get in trouble if we do not recognize the patient because we treat not appropriately, but eventually we can get in trouble because we do not recognize the patient and we don't treat him or her properly. Next slide. The diagnostic test certainly are, is important, not only the clinical feature that you have seen the big list of the different uh, clinical features, but also is important because uh, we can use biochemistry and certainly alkaline phosphatase, if it's persistently low, uh, it can make us suspicious at these days. We were overlooking the low levels of alkaline phosphatase for too long. Then the levels of the phosphate esters can be of help because they are going to be increasing, and G mutation tests can be of use. And then some are talking also about bone biopsy. Certainly, most studies also uh, with, uh, I, uh, with micro CT are going to be um, done in the future because with high resolution, we can see better also the structural characteristic and better understand uh, how the bone is uh, structured in these patients, eventually correlated to the mutation. Next slide. Because uh, um, alkaline phosphatase uh, can be decreased for many different reasons. Uh, here in listen uh, what is uh, persistently low alkaline phosphatase. You see here, in fact, a a HPP is one among, among the different disorders, mostly genetic, that are uh, characterizing uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the persistently low alkaline phosphatase. Then can be transiently low here in this paper by Mac Kierman, where you have, in fact, the different conditions where we can have a transiently low uh, alkaline phosphatase, and it can be instead very acutely uh, low the alkaline phosphatase, and it happens in many conditions that are critical and eventually are not the ones that we see as bone doctors, but it's very important then to keep in mind. So differential diagnosis become important. So alkaline phosphatase per se, without taking into consideration of different conditions, wouldn't be useful. Next slide. And then we can make uh, differential diagnosis also within other disorders that could be either the nutritional rickets, also the X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, or osteogenesis imperfecta. And what happens with these disorders? Usually alkaline phosphatase goes up in any kind of rickets, but in osteogenesis imperfecta is normal. And PLP is going to be high here, but could be even low in uh, uh, conditions like um, uh, in conditions like East Lincoln uh, rickets. So you see, this, all these different ions and parameters could become of interest for us because it, usually vitamin D is normal. Obviously, in HPP is going to be low certainly, or um, normal in other conditions, and certainly normal in osteogenesis imperfecta. And the parathyroid hormone for, could be low in the cases of um, uh, hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria, mostly the very um, the cases that touches the very young patients, mostly recessive, uh, and can be actually even normal in other patients. However, putting together all these different pieces for us becomes I wouldn't say easy, but at least easier to make the diagnosis. Next slide. And here we have, for instance, a report in this case of the clinical laboratory characteristics of symptomatic adult individuals with the HPP diagnosis. 
when you see in fact that in these uh, um, patients uh, where we see more women than men simply because probably more women are seen by a center that is interested in looking at patients with bone disorders than men and you see that uh, these patients can uh, have very similar characteristics if they are symptomatic or asymptomatic with no major differences, even in the levels of the alkaline phosphatase, there seems to be a little lower than it happens to be uh, in the symptomatic versus the asymptomatic, or the uh, levels of PLP that here looks even higher in the asymptomatic versus the symptomatic. So biochemistry is really not so useful but probably the most useful story is the history of fractures. That is the one that takes our attention more probably than other type of symptoms because of our culture and our formation. And most of all, because uh, these are the patients that we take for um, care of because always independently on the original disorder. Next slide. And here is a recent report from the Sheffield Group. Here is an osteoporosis center where uh, um, probably in, as is defined by uh, the group of Estelle. In fact, uh, there is a notable prevalence of HPP patients in this center because fracture is one potential story that is reported to the bone doctor, like for instance, muscle pain or joint pain. And HPP resembles to rheumatologic or bone fragility disorders. Depends which one is the main symptom that that given patient is going to uh, present uh, and tell to the doctor. Certainly, total alkaline phosphatase and PLP are predict predictive of HPP diagnosis. And this group made an effort also comparing to a control group to look at potential levels to which we can set up the numbers for PLP or for alkaline phosphatase. And other characteristics that contribute to the diagnosis are a younger age of diagnosis and that is much different of what happens in the general osteoporosis populations and fractures that could be femoral fractures, also the atypical femoral fractures and metatarsal fractures that are very frequent in these patients. And then we'll tell you mostly about fractures in the appendicular bone. Next slide. Here is the image of atypical fractures uh, in an adult HPP patient. Uh, and they can be bilateral in these patients. Uh, and obviously, these patients could be just one of those patients that was treated with long, long term with bisphosphonates, and no one was looking at alkaline phosphatase at the beginning. So it's very important for us now to look at that biochemical phenotype in order to treat the patients appropriately. Next slide. And here are all the different joint phenotypes in HPP that go from uh, periarticular mineralization because of the precipitation uh, that we just said uh, of um, uh, calcium pyrophosphate, chondrocalcinosis that very often mimics the uh, gut disorder, antisopathy, mineralization that is uh, altering spores and antisopathy, as I said, and conocalcinosis. So a number of very uh, of the signs that very much mimic other disorders. So then the rheumatologist has to make a diagnosis in a case where probably are more frequent disorders, but uh, HPP in these patients. Next slide. And here is the precipitation of calcium and pyrophosphate that happens to be also not only in the joint, but it happens to be also at the kidney level. So that is the point. It's the unaltered mineralization that touches tissues that shouldn't be mineralized, by the way. Next slide. 
And the molecular role of uh, tissue specific alkaline phosphatase was recently described in a paper by a German group uh, that described uh, the inflammatory conditions that are present in HPP that are bone marrow edema, chronic non bacterial osteomyelitis, myovaris, tendinitis, and increased predisposition to periodontitis. And this was explained by a number of factors that uh, the uh, protein seems to have on inflammatory being in sometimes pro-inflammatory, in other cases, anti-inflammatory. At the end, the sum of all these different functions seems to, seems to just um, point to the fact that the enzyme is an anti-inflammatory enzyme. And if it doesn't function, then inflammation happens happens to be either with through toll-like receptors uh, or through um, adenosine. So there is uh, a, a number of theories uh, these days that actually point to uh, tissue specific alkaline phosphatase being actually an anti-inflammatory protein. Next slide. And what is the, new, the molecular role of this enzyme in neuronal biology and neurotransmitter metabolism? HPP patients show neurological symptoms, we just said, from the very important epileptic seizures to depression, anxiety, sleeping disorders, up to very severe encephalopathy. So we need to really look much better into this area. And we are not surprised that there are consequences because vitamin B6 is actually very important for the functioning of brain. And also, um, the, um, the, the PLP, as I said, is important for as a cofactor in the synthesis of too many neurotransmitters. But the enzyme seems to have an influence also on myelination, on synapsis development, on the length of neurites, and the proliferation of new neuronal precursor cells. So many important functions that need to better and to be better understood in order to interpret also symptoms of signs in our patients. Next slide. And here uh, also we find the data from the uh, recently published from the Global Hypophosphatasia Patient Registry. There is a big registry going on around the world where, in fact, there, um, in this uh, um, registry, uh, there was an evaluation in this paper also of the burden of illness that is associated with a patient report quality of life questionnaires. And in fact, it seems from this that uh, the adult patients with HPP have uh, a, a burden of the disease that is not very different from what happens in the adult uh, symptomatic forms. So actually, uh, the uh, very important uh, uh, um, a, a message from this is that adult patients could suffer very much a lower quality of life in a way that is not much different than in pediatric concept, even though in this uh, um, uh, score, there is a difference that is significant. What, what is very important as a message is to say that adult patients uh, have anyhow a, an impact on the uh, quality of life uh, that we have to keep into consideration. And these are the patients that we eventually see in our clinical practice. Next slide. Uh, if we look at the uh, genetically adjudicated adult HPP and epidemiology of what has been reported around the world, we see, in fact, that from the Mayo Clinic in retrospective analysis, it was shown that 22 unrelated patients uh, were seen in 33 years at Mayo. But I'm sure that we go back now to make this analysis. Uh, this is going to change as a number. And data from the other study, the study from CHEF, is showing low alkaline phosphatase in 1 to 1,544 subjects. 
data from northern Spain uh, in 350,000 subjects higher than um, lower, older than 18 years uh, showing uh, an incidence of one in 17,000. Next slide. We have been developing a study that was called Florence Alkaline Phosphate Flap Study that is going to appear soon in, in Osteoporosis International, where we analyzed 12,000 subjects that were offering to our metabolic disease units. Uh, and we found out of these uh, uh, patients uh, a, a number of 55 subjects that showed a low levels, uh, lower than 50 international units per ml and higher levels of vitamin B6. Uh, so we couldn't suspect hypophosphatasia. And one patient among these uh, 56 showed a mutation that is the most frequent mutation in our continent. Uh, and so we can say that if we look at mutation, one in 12,000 then could have a mutation in our uh, in our region in our country, uh, but we also analyzed gene, gene polymorphism. Those that I mentioned to you before. Next slide. And analyzing the polymorphism, uh, we have been looking at the 15 that are uh, just here listed. Next slide. And there was the polymorphism of the alkaline phosphatase that was shown in a Japanese report being functional. And this is uh, in Exxon 7, and it is segregated with higher radial bone mineral density. So this type of polymorphism seems to be functional from the uh, association studies done in Japan. Next slide. In our study, what we have been uh, looking was association of the different polymorphisms, patients that were at one polymorphism, two polymorphisms, three or four polymorphisms associated in the same patient. And we found that the levels of alkaline phosphatase is correlated with the number of the polymorphism in the single patient. Next slide. And also the levels of vitamin B6 were higher in the patients with uh, four polymorphisms versus the one that had just one. Next slide. And here are also the, the metatarsal fractures that seems to be higher in the patients that had four polymorphisms, higher than three polymorphisms than the patients that uh, had the lower levels of polymorphism. So like this polymorphism probably has a function in this population and it needs to be st studied in larger populations and obviously to be considered in the evaluation of the patient. Next slide. And here are a flowchart to which we want to follow our patients uh, with signs, symptoms of HPP, and our family history of HPP. So obviously, if I have signs or so symptoms of HPP or the different times we just mentioned, or a family history of of HPP plus laboratory tests that are here indicated, we want to go into genetic tests. Then we can find different uh, conditions. For instance, I can have a pathogenic variant. One not even recognized, but very much, um, uh, very much uh, linked to a lower function of the protein. Or I can have very rare variant, like it happens here, uh, but that has not have not been described, but eventually not all of them seems to be affecting the function of the protein. And I have a big question marker because uh, is this uh, an HPP patient? And then I can have common variants, the polymorphisms I showed you before. Should this be excluded? So among all these variants, we need to have an agreement in the future that will will reach only if everyone is going to use and analyze its own population with all these type of tools. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. And then we will have the patient that doesn't show anything, but is clinically a perfect HPP patient. And these are the patients that we today cannot consider at all uh, patients that 
we have to exclude for any type of treatment or not treatment. Next slide. And why this disease is very important for us? Because certainly we can offer vitamin D, but this one is needed because otherwise it, it wouldn't solve the problem. We want to avoid uh, antiresorptives. And we have too little data on anabolics that sometimes are taken as a possibility. But we have today a drug that is ascotase alpha. Next slide. We have really to thank um, Michael White and this visionary way of looking at, at the enzyme as uh, a potential therapy, like each one of us could think about this, but then you have to demonstrate it. And then the group of Michael White, together with the company Alexio, developed a drug that is called Strensic. Uh, the content of the drug is ascotase alpha, that is a human recombinant bone target enzyme replacement therapy that was approved by FDA, EMA, and in Japan for the treatment of patients with perinatal, infantile, and juvenile onset HPP. It's an interesting molecule that contains, obviously, the two uh, components of the uh, dimer of the human alkaline phosphatase together with the human FC and the DECA aspartate sequence that make possible uh, just to target to the bone tissue. And it replaces the efficient uh, tissue non specific alkaline phosphatase, uh, lowers extracellular substrates. Uh, it could be administered through a subcutaneous route at six milligrams per kilogram per week, either in two milligrams per kilogram three times per week or one milligram per kilogram six times per week. It improves muscle strength, motor function, respiratory function, survival, uh, mostly with the life threatening forms of the very young children, and fracture healing as a rapid shows a rapid increase and cause a rapid increase in alkaline phosphatase that is observed after the injection and usually is well tolerated but we can have site injection reaction and sometimes ectopic calcifications are seen in these patients next slide Here are the data that show an acceleration of the non-union healing in the patients treated with ascotase alpha. Next slide. And then obviously we need to understand that our patients will be these mild phenotypes uh, under misdiagnosed patients uh, with a clinical expression that is so variable, but it's important to for the clinicians to recognize all the different types of signs and symptoms uh, that these patients can present. So we don't want to forget the kidney, we don't want to forget the joints, uh, we want certainly to look at bone with all the means we have available, and we want certainly consider the best therapy for these patients. The incidence of this population is not yet defined. We have seen different numbers, as I showed you, derived from efforts from single centers, uh, analysis that are done in retrospective in large populations, but there is not a prospective study actually to see at incidence in a prospective manner in order to include these patients uh, in the analysis. That is what we expect in the future to happen. Next slide. and which ones are the uh, problems that we want to solve. First of all, the perception that adult HPP is only of importance for bone metabolic experts, uh, bone doctors, because there are heterogeneous signs and symptoms that very often are under a misdiagnosis. And it's very important for the doctor to recognize these signs and symptoms. But we want also to in, uh, um, introduce the orthopedic surgeons because they see the fractures. They see the same patient that is fractured the tibia, two metatarsal bones, 
the femur, and then need to suspect this. And most of all, the typical fractures that can be a sign of HPP, and they should be kept into consideration. Certainly, the epidemiology, the moderate form, is not fully understood, as well as it's not understood the one of the typical fractures uh, at the femoral level. And moderate HPP prevalence uh, is estimated in France uh, uh, in one over 6,000, and the atypical femoral uh, fractures, uh, we don't have a prevalence that fully estimated in the general population, and usually seems to be linked to the treatment with anti-resorptives. And this could also somehow have, uh, give us insights on the possibility of genetic susceptibility. And certainly patients like the atypical fractured patients should be studied in the future uh, genetically with cassettes that are dedicated to mineralization disorders. And they, the uh, alkaline phosphatase gene will be obviously there. They are no specific alkaline phosphatase gene. Next slide. So if you want to build up then a risk card, we have skeletal signs, dental signs, muscle signs, kidney signs, lung respiratory insufficiency, now we're studied obviously in the adults, joint signs, and certain nervous system signs. So uh, the low uh, levels of alkaline phosphatase activity is combined with high urinary levels of phosphatanolamine and serum ice, serum levels of vitamin B6, and when measured, also high levels of uh, pyrophosphate. The genetic testing is not always diagnostic uh, because uh, even not having uh, a mutation today, uh, we can treat a patient that is severe with uh, aspartase alpha. It's not required the mutation. That's because we understand very well the variability and the impact that on certain patients, uh, the epigenetic or ecological influence can have in the phenotype. That is what should drive our uh, consideration of being a patient, a hypophosphatasia patient, based on the clinical findings and the biochemistry at the serum and urine level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Brandi, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation and for covering a topic that stimulates many questions. I'm sure that your talk was greatly appreciated by our audience. And now I would like to move on to questions as we have received many during the first, during this presentation. Uh, maybe I will start with uh, uh, this first one. Um, is a genetic test necessary to treat the patients? No, as I mentioned in, uh, in uh, this last slide, in my conclusion, in fact, genetic test is not mandatory to treat the patients with aspartase alpha. It's not required by regulatory agencies. Uh, that's because of the many reasons and because we really base our diagnosis on uh, the uh, biochemistry and certainly the phenotype. And the severity of phenotype can induce prescription of drugs like aspartase alpha because there is no response to any ty other type of treatment. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, a question. Uh, do we need to, by Dr. Tassin, do we need to monitor uh, phosphatase alkaline? Uh, do uh, we need to monitor uh, alkaline phosphatase? Okay. Certainly, yes. we want to make more than one measurement. As I said, it could be a transient low alkaline phosphatase. We usually take at least three different measurements uh, at different times, uh, uh, weeks apart, in order to make sure that we have uh, the low alkaline phosphatase and that's constantly low. We want to exclude 
uh, also uh, actions. For instance, we can have an alkaline phosphatase that is low because we are treating a patient with uh, um, uh, antiresorptics that are quite potent. So we not want to exclude this as an interpretation of uh, hypophosphatasia. And certainly we monitor the patient at least at the beginning of treatment because when you use asphotase alpha, alkaline phosphatase goes up, 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 very high values and tends then to stabilize will be higher than is the normal level that happens. We monitor obviously these patients because when you use asphotase alpha, you monitor your patient for anything. It's very important to characterize the muscle function, the bone, anything that you just mentioned, because uh, these are a few patients in the adult age that we are treating, and we want to understand as best as possible the function of the therapy. Yeah, I think uh, so. Dr. Atom is asking a, a question related to that. Uh, what is the most relevant test apart phosphatase alkaline uh, you need to check for diagnosing uh, these patients uh, with HPP? Uh, we want to measure uh, vitamin B6. Also, vitamin B6 is good that you measure in different times. You want to make sure also that the patient doesn't take vitamin B6. So in the history, you want to exclude possibility where vitamin B6 is high just because you take it. It would be very nice to accommodate in this type of measurement also the phosphatanolamine and when possible pyrophosphate. But this means that obviously you have to set up a system with, with either you make a service for the other uh, people that want to measure this uh, biochemistry because not all the labs measure these uh, molecules on a routine manner, so it would be very difficult. So the only one that probably everyone can have access is vitamin B6, even though sometimes doctors also complain on the fact that they don't find a good measurement of vitamin B6 in their own hospital. So that's a problem and probably the company that developed Ascotase Alpha is looking at possibility in the future to really help in diagnosis, offering services that can support the diagnosis because otherwise the patients stay undiagnosed at the end. Thank you. Dr. Grigorie is asking uh, if patients uh, on, on long-term bisphosphonate therapy and uh, with uh, low uh, phosphatase alkaline, should that be tested for HPP? You see, I, I just mentioned that uh, it, we don't want to interpret that as hypophosphatasia. However, if there are signs like uh, uh, fractures uh, at the um, small bones uh, of the extremities, uh, at the tibia, and certainly a typical fractures. We obviously understand that this needs to take be taken in important consideration. But actually, phosphatase is low in patients treated with um, potent uh, antiresorptives. So we don't want to be afraid of that also because they are the drugs that we mostly use in our patients with osteoporosis. It depends on the signs. If you are really doubtful, then at least measure vitamin B6. That could be another way of looking at the problem. But only if there are really suspicions of uh, something that goes wrong uh, behind having low alkaline phosphatase in anti treatment. Thank you. And you mentioned to avoid yeah, anti-resorptive. So Dr. Lopez is asking, uh, what are the risks of treatment with bisphosphonates? Oh no, they they shouldn't be treated with antiresorptives because when you know what the antiresorptives do. Let's say that we have a patient with a mild mutation, apple insufficiency, the ones that we were mentioning before. So they do fine. They weren't perfect eventually. Some problem is there, but no major problem. They are adults now. They develop osteoporosis after menopause is a woman, for instance, and it gets to the doctor, the high probability to be treated with antiresorptives is uh, obviously there. And we want to avoid this because uh, what the antiresorptives do, they take down the alkaline phosphatase that was the reserve that they've been using to get until that age, I would say, almost fine and so we don't want to create the problem because that will be the um, let's say epigenetic 
problem that we are going to create and then we have the expression of the disease even in the worst form that could be uh, the atypical fracture of the femur so we are very responsible for not treating the patients with uh, amino bisphosphonates and the nosma thank you uh professor matt warman is asking a question uh, so he's mentioning that since one in 500, uh, five, uh, 580 people may have symptomatic HPP based on the money paper you mentioned, what clinical criteria should be used to determine whether recombinant alkaline phosphatase should be given? Huh. Now, those patients, one in 500, are those that are very low symptomatology let's say so what they can call mild if not asymptomatic unless we treat with antiresorptics obviously because that makes the problem um, uh, the, the, the parameter that we usually use is not treating a very mild patients with asphotase alpha because uh, if they don't have major symptoms why we have to treat the patients with asphotase alpha that is a very important and good treatment and life-saving in certain patients, but not really to treat a patient that is very mild with asphotase alpha, doesn't make any sense. However, I can have one of these patients that eventually get into a fracture and uh, the fracture is not healing. And I know that the problem is there. And then in this case, I want to use asphotase alpha just because of the non-union uh, fracture that this patient developed and because each one of these patients is different from the other that's the problem as i said very much uh, um, uh, too many endophenotypes so when we talk about endophenotypes is that there is not the phenotype there are many different expressions of the disease but I could treat eventually also a patient that has a very important uh, dental disorder because that could be, in fact, for the quality of life of this patient, to, could have an impact that is normal. And there, uh, probably you want to get into treatment as early as possible, not as late as possible. We start to learn about the disease itself, uh, and we obviously will learn how to treat the patients, eventually not chronically, but for periods of their lives when this is mostly needed. He's also asking another question. Uh, do you think recombinant protein can reach chondrocyte to prevent calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease? Uh, that is more difficult because the aspartate has a tropism for the mineralized tissue. Uh, we have some mineral in those uh, joints, but this uh, for me, it's more difficult, and I'm sure, at least for what I know in terms of, uh, um, uh, depo uh, let's say, um, a, um, a characterization of how the molecules reach uh, the different tissues, there are no information that I'm aware of regarding the cartilage. Uh, uh, and obviously, this patient should be treated, and we have to see if, in fact, there is uh, certainly a lower inflammation, uh, and eventually also dissolution of the of the crystals because uh, that's a real difficult and very important uh, rheumatological disorder and i would say that fortunately many of the rheumatologists uh, have a knowledge on osteoporosis and they know about bone metabolism but otherwise it would be more difficult for a rheumatologist out of the field of uh, bone metabolism to recognize that disorder because alkaline phosphatase is something that you do not measure in a routine manner. And, um, and so la last question from uh, uh, Professor Warman. Do you think HPP symptoms are worse in persons with lower baseline bone formation rates or with higher baseline from bone formation rates? Oh, no, I, uh, what does, uh, you should understand what is uh, low levels of bone formation rates and high levels of bone formation rates in this case. Uh, obviously, when you have uh, um, low levels of alkaline phosphatase, does that mean that you don't have formation of bone, you don't have mineralization of bone, then you should, uh, study cohorts where you have 
well characterized uh, bone formation, for instance, through um, the evaluation also of um, uh, collagen uh, uh, markers. Uh, but this has never really been done in terms of um, segregating populations. As I try to say, is that uh, our culture is very important for this field because it was the last culture to get into, even though there were the very important and severe uh, phenotypes of children and neonates that were very well characterized and Michael White uh, has been working on this disease uh, and he mastered everything that has been done for many years, uh, the French group, but the bone metabolism study like we do bone metabolism in patients uh, with osteoporosis, osteomalacia, has not been really entering this field and it does enter now because of the adult story and we have a very good opportunity to help the patients and then certainly to have the company that develop this product to better understand how important is the impact of, for instance, of knowing bone quality better in these patients uh, and bone formation and so on, because these uh, are not phenotypes that are so well characterized in the populations described up to now. Uh, coming back to uh, treatment, there is a question. Um, is it possible to treat uh, HPP patient with either uh, HRRT or with raloxifene? Uh, there are um, no evidence and reports uh, on uh, um, uh, deleterious effects of uh, uh, antiresorbsis with the low potency, like the ones that you just mentioned, as well as we have few reports and case reports uh, on the use of tenparatide as an anabolic. Uh, nothing uh, I read on abaloparatide, and certainly nothing uh, about antiesclerostin. Uh, antibody. So I'm sure that in the future, some of the cases uh, will be eventually treated. Certainly, it's important to understand that the cost of the enzyme is very high at these days. Uh, so uh, I would dream just to use this enzyme in all the atypical fractures that are around the world, and because it would be really nice to have this possibility. But they, there is not access and reimbursement for this type of therapy for all those cases, even though the company is really looking with great interest to this area for the future. But until the cost is so high, there will be no possibility for us to use in much wider manner. For the low uh, potency antiresorptive, again, from my experience, I would never use an antiresorptive in these patients. Uh, thank you. Uh, and maybe uh, the last question, because we, I think we are reaching, uh, you know, the, the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, for those living uh, in different countries, like, can you indicate what is the best way to obtain uh, this uh, treatment uh, as phosphatase alpha? Uh, so it has been so difficult. Besides the interest we have in this area. Uh, for I make you an example of uh, our experience. Uh, the drug was not uh, um, uh, didn't get the reimbursement for adults in our country. So if we want to use in an adult, we have to apply almost uh, as applying for a very big and difficult grant, uh, and it's not easy easy in our country. And it's the same, by the way almost everywhere, probably different in the United States and North America in general, uh, but it's not an easy therapy to obtain. If you go in countries where this was not even considered by the national agencies, then it becomes uh, very, very difficult. And uh, you, saw, you see one of, um, possibility if one of the doctors that was listening is, as a patient is probably to contact uh, uh, Alexion and to see in which program uh, of uh, uh, compassionate use eventually a patient could be put. Because uh, obviously until the cost of the drug uh, is going to stay high as it is now, it would be quite difficult uh, to spread the use of this drug around the world. I would consider asphotase alpha our next weapon after antiresorptives, anabolic, uh, bone builder, and then uh, inducer of mineralization, because until now, the only inducer of mineralization we had was calcium and vitamin D. 
so indirect inducer. That this is a real inducer. So I believe that in certain conditions we could use even this drug in short terms in certain given patients, but that's not accessible at this day. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, now it's time to conclude. I'm sorry we don't have time to answer all the questions. I would like to thank you all for your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you enjoyed this session. We will post the recording of this webinar on the IOF website, and you will also receive the link to the webinar by email tomorrow. Uh, you will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar. We would appreciate your inputs and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at osteoporosis.foundation. I would like to thank again Alexion for the support to this webinar. And I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Professor Brandy, for this outstanding presentation, for, all, for answering all these very interesting questions. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Uh, stay tuned and uh, maybe uh, we will be uh, together again for our next webinar. Goodbye and see you soon, hopefully. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.